Good morning, ladies. How are you all this morning? And we have to say hello to the few gents that are joining us with the technical side as well this morning. Thank you so much. And hello to everybody who is watching the recording. We're really sorry you couldn't be here with us today, but we hope that you can still enjoy and um, your heart can be touched by the message that's going to be shared today. All right, ladies, so I can't believe we're at the end of the year already, and this is our third event. Um, just at the beginning of January, we were talking about starting this ev- ministry, and look how far God's taken it already. It's just amazing. We just give Him all gl- glory and honor and praise. All right, so we have got a fun morning, even though we won't be picnicking outside today. I really thought hard about it, but then I thought, no, I won't be mean. So... The process for this morning, obviously, is we're going to be starting here and having a beautiful message by a guest speaker who will be introduced to you shortly. And then after that, we are going to um, have hot water available for you in the kitchen area. There's tea and coffee and all of those things, so you can help yourself. I hope you all brought your mugs. If you didn't, we've got some spare. Okay. And then we're going to be picnicking on chairs in the foyer. Okay. All right. Um, just please, you will notice that there are bookmarks on your chairs. You are welcome to take them home with you. It's just a little gift from the Hers Ministry just to remind you every day of who you are and what we are. And if you ever need an emergency contact number, it's on there. So please use it. All right. Wonderful. So, ladies, I think without getting too detailed and into everything I'm going to start off and I'm going to invite our guest speaker Hanley up and she's going to come share with us a beautiful message today and Ray is going to join her and we're just going to open up in a word of prayer okay Good morning, ladies. Um, I'd like to introduce Hanali. She's a special lady to me. Um, I know her from from New Life Church. And um, she's married to um, Mike, who's her techie at the back over there. And they have two children, um, a, a son and a daughter. And they've blessed them with three grandchildren, two grandsons and one granddaughter. Hanali's been at New Life Church for 14 years, and she was ordained there about six years ago. And before that, she was at New Creation in um, Robin Hills. Hanali is very passionate, and I know she's very passionate about the word, and she did that very dedicated to, to actually bringing the word to not just ladies, but anyone who comes across her path. And I know that um, she does a lot of preparation, she does a lot of prayer, when it comes to delivering the word to anyone. And I know from experience that from one of the courses that I did with her called The Word and Spirit, and her other passion, and I know this is her, I think one of her biggest passions, is healing spiritually and physically. And I know I also did that course as well um, in um, New Life, um, Freedom in Christ. And I must admit that's where I think a lot of my healing happened and my restoration. So I'm really grateful to her for that. Um, Her heart is painting and anything that is artsy and crafty. And I think that is also so wonderful. And I just want to thank her for coming here today and for her beautiful soul. And I'd like to just open in prayer, if you don't mind. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Hanley. I know, Father, that she is someone who seeks your heart daily, and I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray, Father, now that as she comes to us and she speaks to us, Lord, that you will use her, that you will open our hearts, you will open our minds, and, Father, that you will just be with her, that you will guide her. And I thank you, and I just say, Lord, that you are an amazing God, and I know that you will be with her and that you will guide her, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ray, for blessing me um, with your words and and your prayer. Um, Prayer is super important. Everything hinges um, 
on prayer. Just from our senior pastors, I'm from New Life, um, Bryanston, as Ray said. So just um, greetings from our senior pastors. It's Pastor Chris and Lisa Stark, and from all of us, the whole um, um, pastoral team there. Um, uh, Lauren asked me and said that this is now the end of the year, and um, if I would speak into the new year and um, about having hope for the new year and just what the new year is all about. So I'm looking forward to that. I've titled um, the, the message Living Hope because I know that your, your acronym, your HERS, the first letter is H and it stands for hope. And then I started thinking about that, that the hope that we have even when we feel hopeless because it's not about God and His truths are not about how we feel. He, he, he likes us to feel we can feel. He also feels. But our hope is the living hope because God is alive. He is alive right now. And whatever is happening, and they, they, it's, it's very tough and very challenging, He still is alive and He will be alive unto all eternity. And so will we. So this hope that we have, even when we are feeling hopeless, the truth is that God, Jesus, is our living hope. And nothing is going to change that. And ultimately, everything is about life and death. And we'll speak more, more about that later on. So um, Jesus is our living hope. Now, I'm sure just like um, your church and, and your families, we have been also through times where we have to pass the people and support people through tremendous um, loss grief um, of, of people, health challenges, economic challenges, um, relationship challenges, and, and, and all those things. So there have been um, um, tough times. But we look to God, and we look to God this morning to speak to us, to minister to us, even against the backdrop of those challenges, because Jesus said, in this world you will have trial, but take heart, for I have overcome. And whatever we face, we are never facing it alone, because God is in it with us. And God cannot really get any closer. This is not in my notes. I think God just <laughs> wants me to say that. Um, God cannot get any closer because than His Holy Spirit, which dwells in side of us. So God the Father is God for us. And Jesus, his son, is God with us. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then the spirit is God in us. So God is with us and in all that that, we, that challenges us and that we have to deal with. And in no way do, you know, is there any minimizing or trivializing of the toughness of the climate and of the pandemic and of all the things that have happened to people. God knows that it's tough, but he says, I'm with you and I will never, never leave you nor forsake you. So against the background of that, I want to speak about the sons of Issachar. They appear in the Bible in the book of um, 1 Chronicles 12, and there is just this, this one-liner about them. And the Bible says, I'm just paraphrasing that, that the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times, and they knew what the Israel had to do. So what the word is saying there is that when we have understanding of the times, of the season of God, then we know what to do. We know how to position ourselves. God gives us strategy in knowing the times and the seasons. 
We do understand that 1 Corinthians says we know in part and we see in part. We know that Isaiah 55 says God's ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. So we do understand that we see in part and we are not God. But what we need to know is just like God spoke to Abraham like a friend and God was telling Abraham what he's going to do. God spoke to his prophets so that his prophets could bring messages so that the children of God, the people of Israel, Israel knew, right, how do we position ourselves? What strategy do we follow? How do we pray? And since the word says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, I certainly, for one, believe that God, in his love and in his care for us, wants us to know the times and the seasons like the sons of Issachar, so that we can strategize, so that we can draw Hope, knowing that God knows what is going on in the season and he's telling us, okay, this is what you do um, in that season. That happens, God works in seasons. The whole word is, is full of that. You know, you can look at seasons and a lot of agricultural imagery about planting and sowing and reaping and harvesting and so on. So God works in seasons. Some, they, they, there are our personal seasons in our personal lives, and then there's the bigger backdrop of the season where the church is at, where the kingdom is at, what, what is God doing, what is he wanting us to focus on at a certain time. And um, I, I just share, you know, from my own life that... Um, Mike and I, we have also faced during this COVID time. We never had COVID, praise God, and thank you God for that. Our daughter did have COVID, but there, there have been challenges that we had to face where, where, um, where people hurt you, where um, you're really challenged, where you're like a victim in a sense. You know, I'm sure I speak for all of you um, that, that you have seasons like that. And I knew that God was working with me personally and saying to me, Honey, above all else, guard your heart because out of it comes the wellspring of life. So in God emphasizing that over the past season for me, not that we must not always do that, we must always do that, but I knew that God was, was um, alerting me to that specifically so that I could guard my heart, so that whatever somebody said or did, however painful it was, however unfair, unjust, all, all of those things, I have to release those people. I have to release those people. I have to not have it in my heart because I have to guard my heart so that the wellspring of life, what I want in Side of me is the life of God. And what I want to come outside of me is the life of God. It springs up from in my heart. So that was, I'm just sharing that, that that was one of my personal seasons. And I knew that if I didn't, um, you know, uh, listen to that season, to what God was saying, I knew that it was going to open up another season for me personally. And that uh, that's why it's so super important, you know, that we engage with the Lord and we, in our intimacy with God and in our prayer life, God will show us, you know what, Hanley, Helen, whoever, I, I'm, there's this thing and I'm working on that and, and that's what you are at. But in the bigger, the bigger backdrop of seasons, um, uh, we are in, the Hebrew calendar is different to our Gregorian calendar. And we are currently in the Hebrew year of 5782. And it started on the 6th of September. It runs from September to, se- to September when the Jewish people, when Israel have the Rosh Hashanah, which is uh, the new year, and so on. So we are in the Jewish um, new year of 5782 from 6th of September our 2021 to 2022, the 25th of September. What is very powerful is that in the Hebrew um, system, numbers have got pictograms attached to those numbers, and there is symbolic meaning then 
in the pictogram which is attached to, to the number. And um, we don't have time you know, to go into all the depths of that. It's called gematria, the study of what the pictures mean and, and that correspond with the numbers. Numbers also have symbolic value. So um, uh, we are going to just have a look at the backdrop of what the Hebrew 5782, what, what are the pictograms in 5782 and what does it tell us? What does it tell us? So interesting, I find these things very interesting. I do a lot of reading, um, I love to do that, into um, this, this kind of thing and the Bible and um, you, you'll be amazed and astonished to discover how things that are in the Bible manifest now even in this current world that we live in. Um, one example which, um, which I was reading on Israel and the state of Israel and um, you know the word says that there will always be somebody from the tribe of David on my throne. That's what the Lord said. And um, when Israel was made a state in, in 1948, when they went back, the first prime minister of Israel's name was David Ben-Gurion. David, the son of David. So he was from the tribe of David. And there is the word of God, you know, literally manifesting itself in world events. So ever, anyway, 5782, we started when 5782, 80 started, the decade of the eight. That was in our 2019 when that started. Very interestingly, eight, the, the picture symbol for eight is the mouth. And um, obviously the enemy came in 2019 when COVID emerged. It was the decade of the mouth. God is saying there is emphasis on the mouth and uh, on on worship and on praise and on declaration with your mouth, then the enemy came and what did he want to accomplish? To close our mouth, to prevent our, us from speaking and from worshiping together and all the things that, um, that you understand. And the mouth is indeed important at all, all times, but in the coming year, God is showing in the pictogram the importance of the mouth and of declaring with your mouth. Proverbs, Proverbs 18 says, the power of life and death is in the tongue. God tells us to choose life. So what we do with our mouths is there is power in what we say, because words have creative power. God spoke and there was light. And when we speak then with our mouth, we have the option of speaking the life of God into anything, into the circumstance, into the country of South Africa, into my family, into my marriage, into my children. I have the power, according to the word of God, of Choosing to speak the life of God into, into that situation. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they, that's us, have defeated him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. It, it, the blood of Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Forevermore, we don't need to make any more sacrifices. But we overcome through his blood and his perfect sacrifice, but also by us using our mouths to appropriate that victory that, that Jesus um, um, established for us on the cross. We appropriate the blood and the victory and our victory by testifying, by the word of our testimony to that. So indeed, it's, it's very, very powerful. Another perspective on the, on the mouth and the declaration is that the number two um, prophetically is ascribed to the voice of the Son of Jesus. The number one, so 5781, was the voice of the Father. And the voice of the Son is ascribed to the number two. Now, the, the prophetic voices and, 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 and what people are saying in that revelation is that this year, 5782, that the voice of the Son will resound 
on the earth. We're talking in the spiritual, in, I'm talking in a spiritual sense. And that as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the sun will lit out a roar because through his mouth, through his mouth, through the mouth of the lion, he will let out this roar. And that roar is both the roar of, the, of warfare, because we are in a war. Uh, we will always be in a war against the enemy. God knows that. God is with us. He gives us the weapons of our warfare. They are mighty, not carnal, for taking down strongholds. So God is saying, the lion of Judah is going to roar out of his mouth will come both that war cry, but at the same time, when a lion roars, it is, it is majesty, it is majestic, it is authority. It, it actually intimidates the whole of the animal kingdom because the lion is the king of the animal kingdom. So there is a, a season of the voice of the sun roaring that triumph and that victory as well as the as the war cry and and same there's such um such spiritual um what can i say nuggets in if we look at a lion in the natural the lion is the king of the animal kingdom not only do other lions respect it when a lion roars but other animals also know the king is around the king is around. The king is marking his territory. The, th- the king is sounding the war cry. And those who belong to that tribe, that alpha line, and as I was thinking, alpha line, I'm thinking, God is the alpha and the omega. The alpha line, the other lines then know that's our leader. That's our king. I'm safe. I'm secure. He's marking our territory. And, and, and any enemy of the tribe, so to speak, will, will have to deal with the king, the lion of, of the tribe of Judah. So the voice is going out to, to mark our territory, to resonate, to call, to, to establish his kingdom. Then in that um, Hebrew um, um, number, the, the number two, the picture attached to the number two, is that of a house or a tent? And what is happening is that we are in a season where God is building his house. He is building his church. And whatever it looks like um, in the natural has nothing to do with that God is building his house. He said to Peter, he said, Peter, on this rock, and yes, the name Peter means rock, but the church is not built just on Peter. The, the church is built on Jesus Christ, the rock, the chief cornerstone. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, or Hades, will not prevail against it. So God is building his church. And we, along that vein, we are needing to look at our own houses, our families, and our church families that we are building there and that we are checking the foundations. Check, is the foundation strong? Is it built on the rock in my family? If there is anything that I need to restore, anything that's not intact, anything that I have to fix, any relationship, anything like that, I'm checking my house and checking my territory. And then in our church families, God is also building the house there. Check the foundation, mark our territory, um, see that it's strong. Because the church is made up out of families. That's the truth. Our families make up God's family, the church family. So there is this thrust towards building the house and restoring the house, our own houses and the family of God. The word says that a house divided cannot stand. So it's incredibly um, important in the season that we go in, both for our families and both for the church, that we are united, that we are strong, that um, we can bring in the harvest of God that he's calling us to. Um, Then uh, one more point I think that I want to make about 5782 is that it's a so-called, in Hebrew, Shemitah 
or Sabbath year. If you go to Leviticus 25, you will find it there that God told his people every seventh year, so six years they would sow and plant and harvest and all of that, but the seventh year God said, you don't sow and you don't do those activities, the land has to rest because it has to replenish. It has to to regenerate. It has to be revived so that when the sowing when they sow again, the ground will be fertile and it will be ready so that the crops can grow healthily and there can be a big harvest. So this year, 5782, it happens to be a Shemitah year, a Sabbath year, one of those um, seven, the seventh year in the cycle that God put into motion in Leviticus 25. The, the Jewish people, the, the Israeli people, and some of them even now, don't sow. They don't sow during this year. But they trust God that they will still be fine and that they will have enough to eat and so on. And um, God says, even in Leviticus 5, in the sixth year, I will give you enough so that you will be okay in the seventh year. What God wants also from the Sabbath year and from the, the symbolism to it is that people would, would rest and regenerate even as the land rests and regenerates, but also that people would completely focus on God, God as the provider, God as the creator, that it, it would be a, they take a breath from their activities, so to speak, and they focus on higher spiritual pursuits, focus on God the provider. Um, and obviously for us, and we'll talk about that, we, we, we're not going to stop our work or anything like that, but there is a deep spiritual principle and a spiritual um, meaning for us in that. So there's lots more to the year um, 5782, fascinating stuff, but I just thought to, you know, to just um, highlight those main things about the mouth, the house, and the fact that it's a Sabbath year. So what does this, um, all of this um, mean for us, and what do we draw from that and personalize for ourselves? Before I do that, uh, I just was so struck by um, one of the um, prophets saying that um, there is a convergence between the Hebrew 5782 and our year 2022, because if you add 5 and 7 and 8 and 2, you will get 22. So also very interesting, there is a convergence of the Hebrew calendar and the Gregorian calendar. So what do we get from that? From the mouth we get that it is a time for us to be bold in declaring God and declaring his promises and actually taking our mouth and going, as for my, me and my household, like Joshua, we will, we will serve the Lord. Even when the enemy comes and says, oh, look at all this that's going on. Where's God? There's a pandemic. No, and and why, what's this, this stuff of yours, this praying and this, um, this God of yours? What's he doing? No, I silence your voice, enemy, and I declare with my mouth into the atmosphere of my home, over my family, for my church family, in my church family. As for us, our household, no matter what, we will serve the Lord. And you use the promises of God because they have creative power and you speak them out and you declare them. God's word, according to Hebrews 4, is living and active when we use that word, when we speak that word, when we declare that word, no matter what it looks like in the natural, God's word is living and active. Why? Because everything that's in the word of God is God breathed by the spirit of God, the living breath of God, the Zoe breath of God breathe the inspiration into the writers of the word. So when we speak and declare the word of God, it is living, God's life is in it, and God himself is active in his word. There are facts, 
And the facts are, yes, we've got a pandemic. The facts are, yes, there's an economic recession and all of those things. Those are the facts. And God wants us to take note of the facts and we're aware of the facts and we are in the world. But over the facts are the truths of God and the promises of God that are in his word. And the truth of God overrides the facts of what we see around us. So as the line of Judah roars, as he is roaring over us and over his church, over his body, we roar over our territories, over our homes, and over our families, and over our churches. We echo that call and that victory that he is roaring out. Secondly, I think it's very important that we build an altar in our homes and also in, in our churches, we build an altar. We don't need to build an altar that we're going to have an animal sacrifice that was done in the Old Testament and we understand Jesus is a sacrifice once and for all. But we do build altars in our home through praise and through worship and through declaration. We build altars to God. And what happens when we build an altar like that, when we're praising God, when we're putting on the worship, we are, we are building that altar. And the word says in Psalm 22 that God inhabits the praises of his people. Some versions of the Bible say, says God builds his throne. He enthrones himself. So what happens when we build that altar of the praise and the worship and the promises of God? God comes and inhabits that with his presence. He literally comes to sit there, to sit on his throne. And I don't know about you, but, but um, I, I want the habitation of God. I want the presence of God in our house. Sometimes at night when Mike and I, when we pray, we're like, God, fill the atmosphere in our house with your presence. God, when people step over the threshold, over into our home, through the door, Lord, let them, even if they don't know what it is, most of them do, but even if they don't know, let them, let your presence, God, so fill the atmosphere. So we build that altar with praise so that the presence of God is enthroned there and God comes to sit there. What does the Bible say about the presence of God? In his presence, we find what we need. In his presence, Psalm 16, we find fullness of joy. Not the joy that is, oh, I'm so happy today, I'm in a good mood, you know, all the traffic lights were working and there was no load shedding. Not that. The deep, deep joy of the Lord. In his presence, we find fullness of joy, of that joy in who God is and who we are in him. And that is for us not against us, that we are not alone, that there is an eternity far beyond this world, that we can have joy here now in our situation, and it's not ha-ha, we can have joy because of God, and that is with us, but we can have joy for the eternal life that God has set before us. You know, as pastors, and that's also not in my notes, and I don't want to um, go over your time. I want to be respectful of that. You know, we do weddings, and I love weddings. I love the whole bride thing, and I watch say yes to the dress, and I'm a closet wedding dress designer, and in heaven, I ask God if I can do the dresses and stuff like that. So I love the weddings. And then we get funerals, and we're like, oh, you know, oh. And, and especially now in COVID, we're in our church, we lost Older people, but we lost younger people as well. And yes, the, the grief side of it is incredibly tough. And you know, your heart goes out to the people. But then I thought to myself, hey, when I'm doing a funeral, for, for Christians, it's not a funeral. There is no death. 
to the, there is no death. So yes, it's incredibly sad for the people who are remaining behind and we minister to those people and we have compassion on them. But this, if I thought that a wedding was a joyous occasion, then a funeral of somebody who dies in Christ is, is a much bigger party than a wedding, actually, because um, they are going to God and he's waiting there to receive them unto all eternity. So actually, they, they, there's no fear for us in death. And that scripture that I quoted from Revelation 12 says they overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they do not love their lives. Uh, um, so so much that they are not willing to die. You understand what I'm saying? So, so we build an altar um, for God. And Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when I'm feeling not joyful, when I'm feeling hopeless, when I'm feeling, God, where is the joy? I sometimes ask God, I'm like, God, oh, um, we need some fun. We really need some fun. And we're okay to have some, some good fun. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. So where do we find it? In the presence of God. And when does the presence come? When we build that altar with our praises and, and, and with our worship. And I do understand, and God also understand, understands that there has, has, has really been fear, you know, fear for health, fear for the health of loved ones, fear for safety, you know, in, in, in our nation where crime is a real problem, fear of losing jobs, fear of retrenchment, all of those fears, we understand that they are very real. But we cannot, and there are times when we can be anxious, and we should, we don't run across the highway because we're scared of the cars, and, and that is a good and a healthy fear. We wear masks now because we need to be wise in the times that we are in. But there is something that can grip us that's a spirit of fear, and it's a spiritual bondage. In the Bible, we find one fear not for every day of a year, 365 times. Jesus, or the Bible says, fear not. There is a spirit of fear that the enemy would want to put on us that grips us in such a way that it almost paralyzes us. It wants to come against our faith, make us hopeless, make us depressed, make us, you know, just give up. And that, God says, we cannot give into that because 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, the Lord says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So when that spirit of fear wants to grip us, we take this mouth and we make that declaration and we speak to our own spirit. I sometimes, when I want to get anxious, I speak to my spirit and I tell it, the word of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. And I actually tell my spirit, which is God's spirit there, to dominate my emotions and to dominate my mind and to dominate my physical body. Because sometimes when people get in that fear cycle, there's a lot of adrenaline in the body, can have panic attacks, you know, the body can manifest in, in all sorts of ways. So I actually tell my spirit to dominate my soul area and to dominate my physical body. So we make that declaration with, with our mouths. Philippians 4 says that we must be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make our requests known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends human understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So what you can literally do, and I believe we can pray in any way. We can say, help me, Jesus, and Jesus is listening, and he answers those prayers. I'm just saying how powerful the word of God is, is that when something is trouble, troubling you, and you want to go into that fear, you go to the Lord, and you say, Lord, your word, Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing. So this nothing of mine 
is X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And in everything, Lord, this situation and everything around it, I'm bringing it to you and I'm making my request known to you. And once I've done that now, Lord, I claim and I clothe myself and I speak to my spirit the peace of God which transcends human understanding and which guards my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Perhaps because of how tough the times have been, you, you, you feel like you don't have an altar, but you can build a new altar. Noah got out of the ark. First thing he did, you know, there was a flood. There was major problems in the world. Got out of the ark and he built a new altar to God. At any time, you can build a new altar. You can come and make that sacrifice, Psalm 50, that sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. Does God understand that it's sacrificial? Yes, it is. If we take that against the ultimate sacrifice that his son had to make, and I, 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 I sometimes also feel down. I'm saying it from my own personal. I'm not, you know, coming from some very um, spiritual place where we don't um, feel that it's a sacrifice to praise. But God acknowledges that sacrifice. So we can make a sacrifice of praise and build a new altar. Then um, the third thing is the rest that that centers around that idea of the Sabbath year, of the seventh year. Hebrews 4, 9, 11 says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. So in this coming year, that's a Sabbath year, spiritually, God says, enter my rest, even in the battle. Fight the battle from a position of my rest. What is that rest? That rest is a secure place of resting in our Savior, resting in His grace. Resting in that he says he will perfect that which concerns us. So we, we you know, we, we have to, it's actually quite powerful here. It's, it's almost like a paradox um, that we have to actively enter God's rest. The active part lies in choosing, in choosing to go into that place of rest and declaring that rest over ourselves, over our families, over a situation. Actively, it is rest. Resting in who God is and resting who you and I are in Him. But it's our choice and our decision whether the enemy can run us ragged or whether we actively choose by faith to enter in that rest this coming year and to stay there and if we the enemy tries to pull us out to go back in and to, to, to position ourselves and to fight the spiritual battle from that position of rest. Perfect love casts out fear. So one way of dealing with fear and of being able to rest is to meditate on how much God loves us and to have that intimacy with him where he can minister that love. Because the more we, I don't think we understand even a little bit how much God loves us. I, I, I don't. So when the fear comes and perfect love, let him quiet you with his love. Enter into that rest by meditating on how much he loves you and he loves me so that that perfect love can drive out that fear that wants to prevent us from entering his rest and from remaining um, in his rest. 
And the fourth, and I think that's my um, last um, point for us for this year, so there's the declaring and the using of our mouth this season. There is the building of the house, of our families, of checking the foundation, and, and um, even church-wise, family-wise, strengthening that, making sure there's unity, the, the house. Then there is the rest, which is symbolized by the Sabbath year, by the seventh year. And then there is hope, because there is always hope in God, because he is the living hope. Um, 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Everything about God is about life. He was life. He was there from the beginning, always has been. He created life. All the power of life is in him. And in his son, we have life. We have eternal life. I know sometimes I'm scared when I, when I preach at funerals that people that all the people there, and I'm just joking, but there is some seriousness in it as well, that I will speak so about eternal life and about heaven that all the people there might wish that they're going to die tomorrow or whatever. And that's not the point because we must, we must live the days of, our, of, of the life that God has given us and we must fulfill our purpose and our calling and we must advance his kingdom here on earth. But... Um, the, this, this, this side of life is, is like a drop in an ocean. Our real life is our eternal life. And it's nothing, nothing can get that. Nothing can get that. Scripture says that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. You know, when a mommy expects a baby, you know the baby's there because you can see the tummy. And what I find so interesting is that the tummy becomes very hard because it's protecting the baby inside the uterus. And God is forming it. It's happening. You can't see it from the outside. But this scripture, our lives are hidden with Christ in God, makes me think of that, that there is a place in God, the, the almighty God, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the creator, the one who is eternal, that our lives are hidden in God, in a place in Christ where nothing, nothing can touch it. So biblical hope is not a hope that's, you know, uh, dependent on the circumstances or what we see around us, the facts. It is a confident expectation of what God has promised. In the Greek and the Hebrew, the equivalent of the word hope is a strong and confident expectation that we, that we have in God. So we are going to close today what, what is also interesting, and if you could see my notes um, on your bookmark, um, Lauren, they printed a scripture there about, may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. My prayer for you and for me and for my church family and for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is that God will come and fill us with his hope and with his peace and with his joy in the power of his Holy Spirit. The same power that the, world, the word in the, in the Bible for power is dynamis. It means dynamite. This dynamite power on the inside of us. God's Holy Spirit, dynamite power. And um, I'm going to close with a priestly blessing from Numbers 6, verse 26. But I'm going to read the scripture from Hebrews 13, 15 to you before I do that. One of my favorites in this particular one is from the Amplified Bible. So right now, if you have felt discouraged through all that has happened, and we understand, or you are physically not well, you're still trying to recover, or you, there's stuff in your family 
that's not healed and, and not whole and these um, things that make you anxious or you've kind of felt like the hope, you know, you don't have hope in your heart at this moment. In here, the voice of the Lord as he speaks to you personally into that situation this morning before we close in prayer. This is Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hear the voice of the Son. Hear the voice of the Father. Hear the voice of the Spirit saying, He, God himself, has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up nor leave you without support. I will not. I will not. I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. I'm going to close while I just bless you with a priestly blessing. Before I do that, I was chatting to Lauren and to Ray and to Deborah before um, the time that we know this priestly blessing. You probably know it in your head. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and so on. It is incredibly deep. So when I pray today, the Lord bless you. What is the blessing of the Lord? The blessing of the Lord makes truly rich and he adds no sorrow to it. The blessing of the Lord is all the riches in Christ Jesus. It is huge. The blessing of the Lord is huge. It's not just that I have a home to stay and we're thankful for those things and food to eat and a job and all of that. And it is that as well. So when we, when we say the Lord bless you with all the riches in Christ Jesus, all the spiritual blessings, the Lord make his face to shine upon us. What does that mean? Does it mean that God is going to show his face? It, it does, in this context, it means that God had to turn his face away from his son who had no sin. He had to turn his face away from Jesus so that Jesus could confront the powers of hell and darkness and see it through because of God's love for you and for me and Jesus' love for us and his obedience to, to the Father. So when this says, the Lord makes his face shine upon you, what we have to get in this is that God looks upon us and will not turn his face away from us because he turned it away from his son. That he looks upon us with favor and with love and with acceptance. And God be gracious to you. Grace is a huge concept. And when we say God be gracious to you, may what happens to you in your spirit and to me when I hear that, may I rest in the grace of God that can never be taken away from, from us. And then the, it says again, the Lord turn his face toward you. And it means we do not actually see God's face, but that he looks, that he takes us into his presence and that he looks on us like a father looks on us. On a child. I know many of you have children and many have grandchildren, Ellen. I don't know if you have grandchildren already. And is there anything, if you, if you have children and grandchildren like me, when you see them, you, you, you want to do everything that you possibly can for them. You want to protect them from the things that are that happen in the world and it is a fallen world and you can't sometimes. And you want to protect them. But just that when, when you look at them and when they run to you and they jump on your lap or you can pick them up or they give you a smile or whatever, that is what we have to see here when we, the Lord turns his face toward us. That Father that, that's, that 
can't wait to have you in his presence, to, to look at you, to love you, to make you feel secure, to hear you, to comfort you, and give you peace is the last part. And that peace that is mentioned there is the shalom peace of God. It's again not a peace that is found in, well, today I've got, my, I've got all my ducks in a row or whatever. It is a peace that rests in Jesus, who is our shalom, the prince of peace. And it doesn't just mean peace as in the absence of any turmoil. It means a state of wholeness. A state of well-being where no matter what is going on, that peace is a state of wholeness, of well-being in, in Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to speak that blessing. And um, I, I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, it's been a real privilege for me, a blessing. Um, you have no idea what it has meant to me to be here with you today. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 I can actually sense the, the peace, maybe you can too, I'm sure, by the Spirit, can actually sense the peace of God, um, of Jesus, in the atmosphere. Amen. I'm handing over to Lauren. Um, God bless you. Thank you so much. Um, is it on? There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hanley. That was such a beautiful message. And I hope you ladies got as much from it as I did. Um, you, there was a lot in there that just filled my heart up. But um, before we go and have any tea or coffee and have our snacks, I know you're all probably hungry. I just wanted to give an opportunity if there are any ladies that do feel like they need prayer for what's happened over the last two years and just need some filling up and encouragement for the new year coming up. Um, please, you're welcome to come forward and stay behind. Um, and one of the core team ladies, or Hanley, I'm sure, would be happy to pray with you um, if you feel you need. If you are happy to, to um, and you feel like you don't need any prayer, you're welcome to go out into the foyer and we'll get the hot water and everything ready for you to have something to drink. Thank you so much, Hanley, for taking time to come and share with us this morning. When we prayed about what we were going to share today, it was unanimous that God was like hope and joy. <laughs> hope and joy. And Hanley just was literally on a silver platter. God saying, here you go. Here's your speaker. So thank you very much. We really appreciate you. And we continue to pray blessing over you as well in your ministry. Okay. So ladies, maybe just take a minute. Um, and Hanley's going to just close for us in prayer. And then um, if you feel you need to come forward, you are most welcome. All right. Father, I thank you for each and every one of your precious daughters in this room today, God. I thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit inside each and every one of them knows exactly what they're struggling with, where they are at, Lord. And, and Lord, I, I sense that with some of them, Lord, it's almost like their hearts are broken, Lord, that there's somebody with, with like, the heart is really fragmented, Lord, because it's dealt with so much. But I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you minister to each and every one of them. Lord, I thank you, Spirit of God, that you come with that oil, of your spirit, that healing balm. Lord, that you would pour it into the hearts. God, that you would pour it right down, Lord, into where that wound, where that sore is, where that open wound is, Lord, and that you would let the oil, Lord, the healing balm of your Holy Spirit 
dress that wound, Lord, and heal that wound, God. And let new skin and cover it, God. And so, Father, I pray for all of them and for all their families. Lord, I pray Psalm 91 over them, God, which says, Lord, that, that when we dwell in the secret place of the Most High and we abide under the shadow of the Almighty God, Lord, we can pray that you command your angels concerning us. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you command your angels concerning them. Lord, that neither the arrow that flies by day whatever form the enemy might take, Lord. Neither the arrow that fly, flies by day, nor the pestilence at midday, nor the terror by night shall come near them, Lord. Shall come near them, Lord. Nor near their families, Lord, their homes, their vehicles. Father, I pray, Lord, that your angels, Lord, will guard them at all times. Father, I pray that you give them your peace, Lord. I pray, God, that you provide for them, Lord, and that you protect them. In Jesus' name, amen.